for the invitation and the kind introduction and thank everybody for listening to me another time today. Um, so what does complementary and alternative medicine or CAM have to do with vaccine hesitancy? I think we all know this. Um, this has to do uh, in, uh, to a certain extent to, uh, with the fact that doctor-patient relationships and doctor-patient communication in the past 20 to 30 years has undergone some trends that mirror other sociocultural trends in, the so in society. And we can refer to these trends as postmodern medicine or, to, or as healthism. So we have well-informed patients that are interested in a healthy natural lifestyle, which um, uh, needs to be underlined. This is in part promoted by health authorities. And Switzerland has the distinction of having, uh, it being the country with the highest worldwide consumption of bio-organic food products worldwide. I don't know if this is still true, but that was a, an article in a, in a very well-regarded Swiss newspaper 10 years ago. So these well-informed patients, they want individualized recommendations. They do no longer wish to be passive recipients of orders by authoritarian physicians but they want to be active participants or partners in discussions. And we all know and think that such patients tend to consult uh, CAM providers more than biomedical providers. And as I said this morning, 25 to 50% of Swiss residents report that they use CAM and the perspectives of parents who use CAM are being increasingly studied in the last years. So CAM usage and vaccine hesitancy seem to be epidemiologically and sociologically linked. Let's take a quick moment to look at the vaccination situation in Switzerland. So on a national level, childhood vaccination rates are high and they are increasing in Switzerland. So if you go from the left to the right, you'll see the country getting darker and darker is better. Um, because it, it implies higher vaccination rates. So vaccine rates are not going down in Switzerland. They're rather stable or going up a little bit. But then we had situations such as this in 2006, 2009. Uh, Switzerland was hit by a measles epidemic and had the distinction again of a superlative um, for being uh, the, c the European country w who had, which had by far the highest number of measles cases uh, in all of Europe. And it became apparent at that time that there were local clusters and large cantonal or regional differences in the incidence of uh, measles. And uh, it became apparent that these measles cases clustered around local complementary and alternative medicine providers and also anthroposophical institutions such as Rudolf Steiner schools. And it became also apparent what these CAM providers did uh, was that they uh, tended to follow so-called individual vaccination scales rather than the official recommendations <laughs> by the authorities. So what they did uh, is what we all know. They per, um, form selective vaccination, uh, they vaccinated later than recommended, but only a minority vaccinated, not at all. And I asked the, uh, the school physician for the Rudolf Stein School in Basel, and she, for some reason she knew this figure, she said uh, she also had asked uh, parents once a couple of years back, and they had a 44% MMR vaccination rate in that school. So we know all that in 2015, WHO put out this call to action that we should start measuring prevalence of vaccine hesitancy. And they said there was a strong need to talk with vaccine hesitant persons and try to understand their motivations. So we put in a grant and got it. And this is our national research program. Uh, it's a four year grant, 2017 to 2021 with a bunch of collaborators. And in terms of study design, our key concept is that we, uh, uh, we have intended to set up a transdisciplinary study team that includes the CAM. So we have sociologists, we have anthropologists, we have infectious diseases <laughs> specialists, we have pediatricians, we have CAM providers, we have uh, general family medicine doctors, we've included the 
public health authorities, and we've included expertise from the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. And we don't want to be external observers of CAM who study the opponents who are against vaccines, who have a knowledge deficit and who are wrong, meaning that we're not, we don't want to be the observers in the zoo looking at the exotic, funny, strange, ugly animal. No, we want to be more like Jane Goodall. <laughs> Uh, we want to learn from the CAM providers, and I'm totally serious. I don't want to be pr provocative here. What do CAM providers actually do right? Uh, there must be something, otherwise 25 to 50 percent of the population would not consult them. So we think that based on such knowledge gained, we can begin to better understand vaccine hesitancy and probably design communication and training interventions aimed at biomedical providers. So we conduct our research together with CAM physicians. We have included now three Swiss CAM physicians in our study. They participate in all our research meetings. And in a, for so, so sort of symbolic reasons, we've decided to, you know, to show them how open we are to them by holding all our research meetings at their own institutions. And the CAM can help us, uh, they do help us recruit additional CAM physicians to the study and we consult them and include them as co-authors on our manuscripts, as you have seen this morning. So some personal attitudes. I don't want to get too personal here, but um, I think uh, if you want to do this kind of research like this, you cannot be a pit bull who wants to bite the cam and uh, introduce mandatory vaccinations. Um, I have the advantage of having lived in a vaccine-hesitant social network or networks for many years. Um, a number of CAM physicians know me personally, and now that and they know that I don't want to harm them or bite them, and they know that I'm not interested in introducing mandatory vaccination in Switzerland. So you know the network issue is you know when I go hiking and mountain climbing, you come across a lot of ecologically naturally oriented people. I actually sent my daughters to Rudolf Steiner schools. And the personal disclosure is that I have no money from pharma, but also that my kids now are fully vaccinated and actually more than fully because they're, they've received hep A, B, and influenza um, ahead of schedule or even though these vaccines are not recommended for children in Switzerland. And I've been a professional Baroque musician since age 10. And if you're a Baroque musician, I don't know if you know any Baroque musicians, but they're all vegetarians and they all don't vaccinate their children. <laughs> so I know what these cam where these CAM physicians come from. So how did we convince the providers to work with us? So again, I've built a reputation over many years. I've been in the same job for 11 years now. Uh, I've built this reputation that I'm gen genuinely, genuinely interested in learning from them, that I want to work with them, and that I don't want to marginalize them or belittle them. Um, and CAM communication styles tend to be more participatory than presumptive, and I'm genuinely interested in this communication style. And it all started with one of my friends from medical school going into CAM, and he's now an anthroposophic uh, medicine provider, and uh, he helped me um, recruit some other CAM providers. So when we submitted the grant, we already had a small network of four CAM physician who showed interest in participating. So what can we, what do we think we can learn from the CAM providers? So over the years, biomedicine, I think, has adopted more and more concepts that actually originate from the CAM sphere. So for example, CAM physicians have been saying for many, many years that antibiotics cause ecological collateral damage. They kill the normal flora of protective bacteria. And only seven years ago, this knowledge has been mentioned and introduced in the United States Urinary Tract Infection Guidelines. Or CAM physicians have been saying for many years that you can and should treat most patients with viral respiratory infections, including sore uh, strep throat, sore throat, bronchitis, et cetera, without antibiotics. And this is only slowly being reflected in guidelines. And in many countries, more than 50% of viral respiratory infection patients receive antibiotics. 
or another piece of knowledge uh, that we're slowly introducing into biomedical practice is that you can treat most patients with uncomplicated bladder infections without antibiotics, even though we now know from three randomized trials that about 5% of these patients treated with a non-steroidal to treat the pain, they may go on to develop a kidney, so an ascending uh, kidney infection or pyelonephritis. And what CAM seem to be particularly good at, and an important reason, obviously, why patients consult them is the issue of patient satisfaction. So again, if we refer to the topic of antibiotics uh, that are not needed for viral infections, there is accumulating evidence that patient satisfaction does not depend, depend on receiving an antibiotic prescription, but on the feeling that I as a patient was taken seriously by my provider, that the provider took enough time for me, that they explained the illness or uh, the, by analogy, the vaccine, and that I actually understood uh, what the doctor said were the next steps, the treatment, the follow-up, et cetera. So there must be something that we can learn from the CAM providers if a quarter to half of the population sees them. So our study is a mixed method study. The first phase was a, and still is, a qualitative phase from 2017 to 19 in French and German speaking Switzerland. We have been doing qualitative semi-structured interviews with parents and providers. We have been able to observe a number of their uh, consultations. And now we're entering the quantitative phase which we've, uh, we were doing in uh, the French, German, and Italian uh, speaking parts of Switzerland. And our statistician has told us we should do 1,350 parent interviews about childhood vaccines and 722 uh, interviews with young adults about the HPV vaccine where we are going to administer the PACV questionnaire plus other items. And all of this research is supposed to be the background for planning and implementing an intervention that we believe should be designed at improving vaccine communication and counseling by probably biomedical physicians. And for that, uh, we don't have time or funds to do it within these four years, but for that, we plan to submit a grant in year four of this national uh, research program for a randomized controlled trial of an intervention. And since we will be designing a communication intervention in year four of the study, we thought it makes sense to include the CAM physicians as co-authors on these review articles and thus to learn from them already today how to communicate on the topic of vaccines with vaccine-hesitant patients and physicians as audience in mind. So here are our preliminary results of the qualitative research. The slide is courtesy to my uh, courtesy of my uh, fabulous uh, PhD student, Mike Demo. Um, we have 35 um, providers in Romandie is the French part of Switzerland and Deutsch is the German part of Switzerland. We have 18 and 17 uh, providers. We have 12 and 14 parents and you can see we have, uh, we have emphasized recruitment of, um, of persons that we believe are going, going to be vaccine hesitant. Um, and we have been able to observe 23 total consultations uh, in different practices. And again, the slide is courtesy of Mike. Um, we, we don't think we've seen any simple dichotomy in terms of uh, providers being totally pro or anti-vaccines, but there seems to be a, a spectrum where obviously the CAM, CAM providers are probably more he hesitant and the biomedical providers less hesitant, but there's a degree of overlap here. And I also think that the most hesitant providers that are on the left of the x-axis, they're not participating in our study. So how do we know this? We've actually been receiving kind of nice emails from some uh, vaccine hesitant providers telling us why they don't want to participate. And these emails can be very long and they say things like, you know, I'm not going to participate in your study because I don't share two central tenets or concepts of your study. For example, that vaccines are safe and effective or that the goal uh, should be to increase vaccination rates. I don't agree with that, so why should I participate? Thank you very much, goodbye. So we've received a number of such emails. So we think when we say we, we're, uh, we're interacting with CAM providers, it's probably a less um, hesitant um, um, fraction of the providers 
and that the most hesitant are not participating. And why are they, uh, other reasons they've mentioned why they don't want to participate is that they're concerned that we're sort of doing espionage for the health authorities, that the knowledge gained, the, the data that we're gathering will in, in the end be held against them in, in, in order to introduce uh, mandatory vaccination in Switzerland. Second uh, preliminary result is um, in regards to CAM providers' perspectives on vaccination in general. So we don't think they're categorically opposed to vaccination. There's a large spectrum and they tend to uh, position themselves as Pierre already mentioned from his study in France, as providers who reflect critically about the need for each individual vaccine for each of their individual patients. And they do have other views on illness than the, the mainstream biomedical views, of course. For example, that as we know, measles is often considered a benign childhood illness that uh, represents the opportunity for developmental progress by a child. And uh, CAM providers definitely seem more likely to take personal experience with adverse vaccine events into account when they counsel their patients about the risks of vaccination. Um, an additional finding that uh, somewhat surprised me that w was that uh, CAM providers uh, sometimes frame Switzerland as a safe space. So they say things like, you know, your risk of contracting tetanus or polio or other vaccine preventable infections is low in Switzerland. And in case you do uh, contract a vaccine preventable infection, pertussis or whatever, the Swiss health system is very good and, uh, you know, doctors will deal with this infection if your child gets it. And another important aspect, of course, is that uh, CAM providers tend to question the necessity of uh, the official recommendations in terms of vaccinations being kind of a mass vaccination policy that applies in the same general way to all members of societies. And a famous quote that we like very much is that uh, one CAM provider said, you know, after all, we're treating humans and not herds of cattle, you know, herds of animals. So public health approaches to vaccination might not necessarily be justified because they don't take into account the individuality of patients, their individual context and their individual wishes. And finally, as in terms of um, preliminary results, CAM physicians tend to emphasize individual patient choice. So we don't have any mandatory vaccines in Swiss Switzerland, so there is an individual choice. Um, so they incorporate the knowledge of the patient into the discussion, they incorporate the, the wishes of the patients, the social context, and they also incorporate the general health and what they perceive as a, a strong or not so strong constitution of the child into the vaccination decisions. So their role uh, repeatedly seemed to be not somebody who prescribes vaccines to their patients, but who doesn't uh, recommend anything, but who accompanies the, pa the parents in their own decision making, which may take time. So this may be a longitudinal process. So now we're entering the quantitative research phase uh, where we're doing the telephone interviews with parents about the childhood and with young men and women about the HPV vaccine. And there our concept is to recruit again in offices of providers, biomedical, and again, selective over representation of CAM offices. And we've decided for the moment to not recruit via a representative sample provided to us by the Federal Office of Statistics because we prefer having the link of the patient to their provider and we prefer having the link uh, with a patient that we actually personally recruited in these offices rather than somebody who we've never met and talked to them over the phone for the very first time. So here's the map of Switzerland. The orange part is the German speaking part which is about 63% of the population, the French part is 23% green, and the southern part towards Italy is the Italian-speaking part, uh, which is about 8%. So uh, as of yesterday, we have seven biomedical and 12 CAM providers uh, participating in the French part, 18 and 21 in the German part, and five and five 
in the Italian-speaking part. And some of these numbers represent group practices, so it, it, it's, it's many more providers than you, you actually get the impression here. And we're administering, as I said, the PACV. We're um, in, we've included some sociodemographic variables, and we'd like to capture vaccination history by uh, uh, taking a photograph of the vaccination booklet of each patient um, in order to correlate the verbally expressed vaccine hesitancy with the actually done or delayed or omitted vaccines. Um, we have one more minute. And um, so, you know, p some of these items focus on the reasons why people use CAM. Have they been dissatisfied with their previous biomedical provider? How satisfied are they now with their CAM uh, provider? Uh, what sort of world views and views towards biomedicine do they have? How much time does the current provider and the previous provider spend with them? These sort of satisfaction items that I've alluded to before. Does the the, uh, the provider include the, uh, the patient in uh, shared decision making? Do they use a patient-centered communication style? Um, we'd like to find out, obviously, who the people are that use CAM, where are they sociologically and geographically situated, and we'd like to see if CAM usage is correlated with vaccine hesitancy and or with under immunization. So in summary, um, in order to understand vaccine hesitancy, we think we need to go to the vaccine hesitant patients and physicians and talk with them. Um, we're applying the concept of learning from the CAM, including them in our research team to gain deeper understanding <coughs> of their vaccination concepts. And we believe that we will be able to use the insights gained from the CAM in order to design better communication interventions focused on vaccine hesitancy. And I'd like to thank our incredibly um, fabulous uh, research team for this collaborative effort. Thank you very much. Are we? Uh, Cornelia? So thank you for these insights and your talk. I think it's really an interesting angle to look at also the, um, this kind of practitioners. I, I was wondering also related to your talk in the morning, um, whether you test the effect on trust, confidence, risk perceptions of these changed materials. Because um, as you were suggesting in the morning, um, the CAM physicians suggested to put in you know, to change the sequence of how you report about risk. So there are some single cases, but large studies mm -hmm. show no relationship or something like this. Mm -hmm. So this is a very different way of talking about risk and using the single cases and maybe stories, <laughs> etc. cetera. Um, you know, it makes a big impact. So are you testing any of these suggestions that you deriving from the CAM people? No, because, you know, this is sort of the, the, you know, the rehearsal for the concert, right? The, the, this is not the real intervention. This is more, um, you know, showing our ability and our willingness and our interest to interact with them. As I said uh, this morning to Katie, we, we, you know, they are co-authors and I don't take all of their recommendations. And actually they've not said any silly or funny things, right? They don't say, oh no, we don't want this vaccine at all because probably if they had such attitudes, they would not be working with us anyway because that they're at the far left of the vaccine hesitancy um, scale. So the answer is no, we're not testing any of these communication approaches. Uh, yeah. Could you give a, a little bit more insight into what the intervention purposes would be? Because you, you, you've said that you know, you're, you're not trying to, I mean, these folks aren't interested in increasing immunization coverage. So is, is the intervention you would be designing to be directed at CAM? physicians or, or other physicians mm -hmm. more broadly to get them to adopt some of the things that you've picked up here? Yeah. So, you know, I don't know if the, I don't know yet if the CAM physicians are going to listen to what I tell them to do in two or three years when we design our intervention. 
Um, what I believe is that it's uh, pretty likely that biomedical providers are going to listen or are going to interact with us, but I'm not sure whether CAM providers will <coughs> attend any information, communication, counseling, vaccination seminars put on by, by myself, for example. So I'm not sure yet who the intervention is going to be directed at. Um, I think, or my goal is to have an intervention directed at all kinds of physicians, and if we get the CAM on board, then we are likely to have, a, have CAM providers sitting in the audience. If we don't get the CAM providers on board of the intervention, it's probably going to be only biomedical providers. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> of Technology Sydney. Thank you. Um, a question and then first please and then a comment about the intervention. Did you ask the CAM practitioners about their education and training in vaccination and, and probably specifically conversations with parents about immunisation? So somebody asked a similar question this morning in terms of are they medical doctors? So yes, almost all of our CAM providers are not providing, are not, yeah, they're not practising alternative medicine in, sen in the sense that they don't practice biomedicine. So most of them in oh. Switzerland are uh, doctor med. They went to medical school and then either during their training or during their postgraduate training obtained additional um, um, alternative medicine training that they apply in a complementary or integrative sense. I know these I are see. all words, but yes, no, yeah, I, I think we all know, you know what I mean. They're, they're they're not going totally away from biomedicine, most of them at least. There's one or two providers who say things like, you know, I never vaccinate, but that's a, very, a small minority. Yeah. Uh, a quick comment. Well, I'm doing some very similar work actually in Australia, and I'd love mm -hmm. to speak with you about mm -hmm. that. Uh, and at the moment, we're in the field with try uh, just a, a small study, but trialling a decision aid with complementary medicine practitioners in terms of their willingness to use that with parents. Um, in their conversations about vaccination and they're enthusi extremely enthusiastic and it, we're going really mm -hmm. well with it. So mm -hmm. I'd love to talk with you yeah, about that. I'd love that. to talk to you too. Right. You know, I'm very happy with the way this has been going, these interactions we've been having with these CAM providers. This is very smooth, very interesting, yes, very, very uncontroversial, nothing provocative, very, very pleasant. You know, I'm yeah. learning a lot. I love doing this. Yes, please. So when you say alternate medicine, what do you mean, you know, that's the... Yeah, the actually, for, you, good that you mentioned that. So of the, provi the CAM providers we have, about a third would describe themselves as anthroposophic providers. But if, if you look this up on Google, most entries will be called something like anthroposophically extended medicine. Again, to underline the fact that this is not being used in exclusion of biomedicine, but they're, they're, you know, they also give antibiotics, for example, but they might try anthroposophical medicines first, and if the fever doesn't go away in whatever, two or three days, they will give an antibiotic. But if they give the antibiotic, they will supplement this with natural or homeopathic measures to counteract the possible negative effects of antibiotics. That's so, uh, I'm sorry, a third anthropologist.